the Asian American Pacific Islander Nurses Association of Nevada presents Healthy Mondays with Apina of Nevada. Start the week healthy and right with interesting conversations on living a healthy lifestyle. And now, your Healthy Mondays host, Dr. Mary Faye Axon Armstrong. Aloha! Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pagtangkilik sa aming programa at patuloy na pakikinig sa aming programa. Alam niyo bang mahal namin kayong lahat? Kaya, kaya naman, eh, pinahatid namin sa inyo ang mga importanteng informasyon para kayo ay maging manatiling malusog sa katawan, pag-iisip at tananaw sa buhay. At para naman po kayo ay malayo sa diskrasya. I just... Greeted everybody in in Tagalog, uh, thanking them uh, for continuing to listen to our program and also uh, for uh, that we love them. Absolutely. That's why we're bringing all this important health information to keep them healthy, mind, body, and spirit, and also to keep, keep them safe, especially during this global pandemic. And tonight, um, our listeners out there, I have a repeater. I think this is his third time to join us, Dr. Manas Mandal. He is an associate professor from Roseman University College of Pharmacy. He's also a co-Fulbright specialist, also a friend of mine. We yeah. were just... Welcome, Dr. Manas Mandal, to Healthy Mondays. Thank you. Thank you, Marife. Uh, thank you, John. Aloha, everybody. But thank you for your invitation, repeat invitation, invitation to me. Uh, let's talk about uh, current health situation and anything uh, around that issues. We all going through an unprecedented time. But as I mentioned in our last talk, that I'm very hopeful. Finally, perhaps we started seeing the so-called light at the end of the tunnel. As we move forward in today's session, I will love to bring some of the latest uh, development in vaccine research and vaccine clinical trials, etc. But thank I you. wanted to, yeah, thank you, Dr. Manas Mandal. Um, I, I just wanted to say that um, to make it real to all our listeners out there and real for ourselves. Like today, I had to bring my son to his school to drop off his old textbooks uh, yeah. from last calendar year, right. uh, academic year, and to pick up some of his books. And I'm sure you have in the same predicament. My, my daughter, yeah. I, I have done with, with my daughter. Actually, her mom did that. I was uh, at work. She took a time off to do that day. That She did that a month back. Yeah, they're going to start school. They're going to start yeah. school on Monday and we're all right. worried like, okay, are they going to be face to face or going to be online? And then if it's online, what are the things that they need to do? Um, yes. There's a lot of uh, increased stress for everybody. But I think tonight we're going to focus and concentrate on an update because um, er our listeners out there, Dr. Manas Mandal is also an immunologist and he worked at yeah. National Institute of Health. And then he he is he was also in, involved with uh, random um, trial tests, right? RCTs. Um. No, no, not directly involved, but what, what um, uh, I, I was a long time uh, viral vaccine researcher. I mean, uh, how you develop a vaccine against or specific for a virus infection and uh, what I was doing for last three months, uh, as soon as the infection started uh, all over the country uh, and in our valley, I started learning as much I can from my own uh, natural interest, how this infection develops, what are the symptoms and what are the treatment and uh, vaccine and uh, different tests. So I created a course, infection immunity course, particularly targeting uh, this COVID-19 infection. And last week, uh, I had a webinar uh, for our uh, faculty, alumni, and friends uh, who, who could join us. Uh, I talked about all these things. So regarding a school opening, uh, as we understand that CCSD uh, had taken a decision that they will not bring the students uh, in the classroom at least to begin with for this semester, fall semester, I think they did the right, they did take the right decision. Yes, it will create some difficulties in some student population uh, who does not really very focused and does not have the adequate resources at home. It takes a lot of self-discipline resources in terms of computational, uh, a little bit 
um, availability, having a good computer, good internet uh, system so that they can log on and they are self-motivated to do their assignments, do the study at home, taking uh, care of their uh, study needs. Uh, so they decided to begin the school session that way as we move forward with this infection, meaning depending on the situation, if it goes below the infection rate, I think their cutoff range is below 5% in the community. Perhaps at that point, they will also think that can we bring a staggered classroom? That was one of the early discussion that Tuesdays and Fridays, Mondays and Wednesdays, some students comes to school four hours a day, then they go back home, next group of students comes in so that they can maintain the physical distancing with adequate sanitization, hand washing, mask wearing, that can minimize the infection. But to do that effectively, keeping our children safe, mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, giving them the learning opportunities, bringing them back at the school, perhaps we are not there yet. That's the way I also personally feel. So current uh, approach by CCSDs, I support it, but it is, everyone understand that this is not the best one can do in terms of learning and teaching our students. But again, this is an unprecedented situation. We have to say all sacrifice somewhat, some degree, so that we can keep the infection at a level where we are not afraid to go out to do the things that we used to do. Mm -hmm. But we all have to, and I wanted to emphasize, and I'm sure you agree with me, we all have to do our role our in, in yeah. bringing down the number of cases because yeah. um, I yeah. still hear uh, individuals who are refusing to wear their face mask Yes. And refusing to follow the protocol for social distancing. Yes. And also uh, not confident that we're going to find that, uh, the, you know, the, 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 treatment the vaccine. vaccine. Yes. yes. The, the, there are the main casualty, the way I personally see as an academician, immunologist and researcher that the main casualty, apart from the patient's who are infected, public trust, public consensus opinion, what could get us through this pandemic situation. Mask prevents the infection and virus doesn't have any color, <laughs> does not belong to any political parties. No it's age. Easy. Yes, no age. <laughs> it's a disease mm -hmm. and it's a very serious disease, severe disease. It's very serious because this disease never attacked us before. It came from an animal source. Mm -hmm. So when we have not seen this disease in us through generations, we are very vulnerable to this infection. So we have to take additional precaution what we take, for example, to defeat in seasonal influenza infection. It's much, much more serious in nature than regular seasonal flu. So mask wearing, I do not use even the word social distancing. We are socially close, but yet we are physically distanced. If we maintain the physical distancing in our marketplace, in our groceries, going to the park, going to the gym, six feet away, wearing mask, wash our hand, we should get over through this difficult situation. And we can bring the rate of infection way down so that more comfortably, confidently, many of us can do our, can continue on with our normal lifestyle. Still, we have to maintain those mask wearing, me. physical distancing, <laughs> hand washing, basic health precautions. If we do that, then we will <coughs> get over with it. Now coming to the second aspect of our, of your uh, point that is there any hope to have a vaccine in near future? Yes, I am very hopeful. Being a vaccine researcher and immunologist, I am very, very hopeful. At least I. it is very difficult to predict what will come up into the market in next three months. But I am very hopeful that in next three months, by the end of this year, at least, we will have at least more than two, if not three, qualified good vaccine coming from different companies. 
and many companies agreed to offer these vaccines at a minimal cost to the public, then it will be our turn to go line up in those vaccine outlets, immunization clinic, to take the vaccine in good faith that it will not do any harm, but it will protect us against next season's infection. It will not be perhaps the best vaccine, but it will be sufficiently good enough to protect us for the next season, meaning 2021, this COVID-19 will be with us in 2021. It will not go away overnight, even with the vaccine, but vaccine will minimize the rate of infection and we will regain our almost going back to our normal life pre-COVID-19 era. I'm very hopeful about that. Well, we had the, the flu, the seasonal flu that is still with us. So it's yes. a virus, so it will be with us. The question is, how yes. are we going to prevent it from spreading and how are we going to pro to get away from this global pandemic? And so I hear some, some on the social media that, oh, that COVID-19 doesn't really exist. And so you need to wake up and see yes. globally that it does exist and that people died, not only the patients in the community, yes. but also our healthcare providers. I personally yes. know people who are healthcare providers who had passed away because of this yes. um, COVID-19. We, we, we are all ever. So yes, it's a very good point. It's not just what I believe I think. As a member of a society, I have shared responsibility for my own safety. Along with that, our community safety, members of my, my society, my immediate family members, my fellow community members, I have a responsibility towards them. No matter what is my personal belief, mm -hmm. that should not interfere with the community safety as a whole. Because even one does not believe in the infectivity of this virus, this is a real virus. This is a very dangerously real virus. Its rate of infection, its morbidity means the harm it could do, it's at least 10 times more, if not higher, 10 to 20 times more than any virus infection we have known so far, including seasonal influenza virus. So we have to be very, very careful. Why it is so? There are many reasons. The foremost reason is that this infection never infected us before. First time we are encountering this infection, our body doesn't know how to respond towards it. That's the major reason for such a high degree of mortality, infectivity with this virus. I can tell an anecdotal story towards this belief or not be, non belief. Back home, I'm from India originally. My hometown is Calcutta. I have many family members who are in the healthcare setup. My sister in law is a physician. He retired, but he was called back. He was about 64 or so to serve during this infection. And he is a public health physician. He is involved in immunization, COVID notification, all those planning, etc. He himself got infected. He came back home, spread the infection to his wife mm -hmm. and a daughter who, who still lives with them, unmarried. She got perhaps the touch of it, but luckily they all recovered. But he believed in the cause that being a physician and he had diabetes and he's a cancer survivor. He still went out to help the community, but by doing so, unfortunately he got infected. But good thing is that he recovered. So we need to focus on that protective element of this infection. This infection is a real infection. It does not spare anyone, not even a physician, not even a healthcare worker that Marife, you mentioned that yes, unfortunately, we lost many frontline healthcare workers. And if we all take our turn, do our part, we would not be infected that much. So we not we will not end up going to the hospital, burdening the system, already they're heavily burdened, and maybe give a little breather to our our frontline healthcare workers, nurses, physicians, pharmacists, uh, EMT uh, operators, all those individuals, they're human beings too. They have a family to go back. We have responsibility for their well being. If they are not well, they cannot help me to stay mm -hmm. well. 
Yes. So, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. And thank you for sharing your story. Uh, I guess one of my questions, if I was uh, an audience out there listening to our show right now, yes. um, what would be uh, some, especially here in Nevada, um, what would be some some action that they could do if they think they have it and where can they go to ch be checked for uh, testing? Here. Testing, yes, that's a very good question. And there is a lack that has been perhaps acknowledged a little bit at the administrative level, state health department and uh, state, uh, state administrative level. They should have began this whole process of public education awareness going to the minority community. Mm -hmm. Why is so? There are few distinct aspects in this. You and me come to work driving our car. We have that resource. But many of the minority community, they do not have that resource. They depend on the public transportation. Their work doesn't allow them to work from home. Maybe they are working at a grocery, at a gas station, at a car wash, small restaurant. Their work simply cannot be done staying home. So, they cannot distance themselves from the infection that may come in to them, expose them to that infection, serving another customer, who is another community member. So perhaps there, and also, unfortunately, there's a huge health disparity mm -hmm. in those socioeconomic groups. And that has been unearthed from Louisiana through New York, if you track the infection, where it was highest, where people died most, where they are the poorest of the poor in socioeconomic status. Thus, they do not have adequate health protection. They have many comorbidities. They simply do not access, cannot access regular wealth, well-being measures. So the public health education perhaps should have been initiated at that end not end means in that part of our society where they needed to learn, they should have been given the resources, such as as simple as giving them a mask, telling them that wearing this mask protects the infection by 70%, it cuts down the rate of infection. They would not know that because they're not trained. They do not have resources. They do not have access. They needed to be told that wash your hand, don't touch your face, monitor your blood sugar, monitor your blood pressure, take your medications regular basis. If you cannot go to the uh, pharmacy, call the pharmacy they, if they can mail it out to you. So all those measures very early on before the infection be became the community-wide infection, we should have been reached out to them educate them about the nature of the infection, danger of the infection, and how one can protect to their best of their abilities so that they have the tools. Perhaps, the, perhaps there was a lag in that aspect, but still we can do that. We can still do that going out to the community, such as minority community who are more vulnerable towards this infection mm -hmm. and who will suffer the worst suffering if they come in contact with this infection along with those communities other community they are most vulnerable is elderly community in our valley the majority infection are either from elderly homes senior care facilities or these minority communities Hispanic and other perhaps minority, Asian minority communities. These are mostly located in these areas. So we have a responsibility to go out to them because again, even when it will come down, this infection will remain in the community. So we lost some time, but there is still ample opportunities for us to go out, to educate them, to provide them the resources what they should do, they should not do, so that they can protect themselves for next 12 months. 
Now, education is very powerful, and I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, with the education, we also need to break that barrier of that cultural norm, because yes. also in the Philippines, you know, we all wanted to uh, get together, have a party, have a you know, have a good time. And then, uh, you know, it's not a normal thing to wear your mask, and then you can't really see everybody's expression, you know. Oh, so okay. I, I think with the education, we need to like, this is not going to be permanent this is no, temporary this is part, yes. you could still get together but you have to yeah. wear your mask and then yeah. you have to do social distancing i think it's very important very to touch important. upon yes. that particular aspect of education public education right. and you're right um yes. in research we need to go to where the the participants are you know when you do right. your research sometimes the participants will not come to you because they no, don't see any any value of why would i go to them to be able to do the research. So when you do research, you go out there in the community and find right. the participants, right? Right. right? So this is one right. way, yeah. Yes. And, and, and as, honestly, you, you touched upon a very, very important point, Marife, that we as educator researcher, we needed to, we need to go out to the community because community does not know, essentially, does not know me. Mm -hmm. They may know you, individually, but perhaps not many know your expertise, how you can help everyone else in your community, outside your community, through your expertise, through your thought process, how you provide, disseminate the information. So yes, we need to reach out to them rather than waiting for them to come to us because they may not be aware of us. It's a simple awareness. Mm -hmm. And um, we have the responsibility because one of the mission statement of our university is serving your community. That's the mission and mission statement for any academic institution of higher learning that with our expertise, other than teaching our students, doing our own research, we needed to go out to the community for their greater good, for their well-being. And that is the real value of us being a faculty member within the university that operates within the community. We need to share our knowledge and experience and what we already know. Yes. And I know that uh, we need to uh, share that there is hope. You know, this, yeah, hope. this, whatever this is happening, staying home and all the limitation that we have is temporary. It yes. will um, Go away. remain, yeah, it will remain like this. Um, for as long as we are not following the the protocols, yes. if we are not believing that wearing face masks is really going to help contain yes. this virus, and if we are doing social distancing, that it's really going to help. And again, going back to what you say, the community trust, the, the public trust, that public. this is real, this is how we can help each other to uh, you know get over this global pandemic. and um, before we find the actual most effective vaccine in the meantime, there are other treatments. I think during your yes. presentation, yes. Um, can you share a little bit yes. about those yes. treatments? Yes, yes. Uh, thanks for giving me that opportunity. Yes, there are hopes. So let's not lose our hope. That's my first message. Why I'm hopeful? I'm hopeful because through this infection for last six months going around in the world, scientific community, scientists, nurses, clinicians, all are working to understand this infection and came up with a various approaches of treatment. One of the antiviral drugs everybody was talking is remdesivir. Another one is clepaviria. So remdesivir has been shown to reduce the number of hospital duration for severely ill patients. And it also reduced the number of deaths Patients treated with this antiviral drug, remdesivir, that it can inhibit the viral growth, reduce the viral growth in someone's body when they become infected. But there are a couple of hurdles of releasing this drug in the market for a patient to take on their own. It, it can be only at this point given through an injection intravenous drip. It can be given only through an IV drip at a hospital setup. But people are working to make the formulation available as an oral formulation. Another drug 
that people commonly take, many such as uh, various autoimmune disease, inflammatory disease patients, such as rheumatoid arthritis patient, inflammatory bowel disease patient takes, such as dexamethasone, steroid, right? We know that steroid yeah. brings the inflammation down. Mm -hmm. Dexamethasone has been found to be very effective in a clinical trial with Oxford University in London. That is another helpful drug. Patients who are generating tremendous inflammation in their body, in their lung particularly, many of them are ending up at the hospital ICU. Lack of breath, intubation, ventilation, but early on dexamethasone treatment can reduce that inflammation in someone so that they don't end up in an ICU. They can take a home quarantine, take a little bit of low dose of dexamethasone very early on so that, that that can keep their inflammation down and their body can fight off the infection. They don't need to go out to the, to the ICU level treatment. Third, detection. There are at least three ranges, three levels of detection. And today I was reading an article, uh, Duke University faculty came up with a saliva mask. One, one of the nurses, did, is that you Marife asked me about the saliva testing? Someone asked me. I think my, so. Yes. So that, that yeah. information came out today that yes, uh, there is a test uh, uh, that has been approved uh, by FDA where one can just give a speed, a, a drool. So that can be collected at a distance as you mm. hoped for. Yes, that is available. Rapid antigen testing is available where it can screen within 15 minutes that yeah, someone has a, a infection or not. Antibody testing is there. So improved testing and availability of testing and test results are being known, such as rapid antigen testing can be known within 15 minutes. I can simply wait at a waiting room or in my car within 20 minutes, I will know whether I have the virus in me or not. So that's another tool to fight this infection. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, I am very, very hopeful that at least I believe three different vaccine formulations would come to the market. I'm very hopeful about Moderna's vaccine formulation, AstraZeneca's, that Oxford University vaccine formulation, and Pfizer's formulation is also, I know Vio and Pfizer's vaccine formulation is also heading very well. So any of those three vaccine formulations or all three at some time point in next three months might come to the market. So using all these resources, early detection, little safe distancing, wearing masks, and a couple of treatment options, remdesivir, dexamethasone, finally vaccine, we can win, we will keep this infection as a community-based low-grade viral infection, such as influenza, we will manage it. Let's not forget that we lose, unfortunately, 60 to 70,000 US citizens every year through influenza infection and influenza related illness. If when that is true, we can keep COVID-19 infection somewhat like a seasonal influenza infection level where we do not need it to be panicked. We do not need it to shut ourselves off, but until it situation gets more stable for perhaps next three to six months, if we can strictly maintain physical distancing, mask wearing, hand sanitization, no touching, frequent hand washing, and some self-imposed, somewhat a uh, little bit uh, self-imposed quarantine type of approaches that if I don't need to go out oh. there, don't go out. If I, when, do you know when do I go to go to the grocery? First thing in the morning, when no one is there, mm -hmm. not the surfaces are touched. Anyone can do that. Yes. I'm going to the grocery. I need to go to, go to the grocery. But how about I go, they open up at six o'clock. I reach there by 6.15. If I can, then everything is untouched. Things are cleaned. I go in and out with a mask wearing within 20 minutes. I protect myself, protect my family and protect the community. We just have to be uh, vigilant. So, we have to be vigilant. Yeah. that is the right one. 
And I, as you said, you know, this is not the first time no. a virus in the community or globally had yes. affected us. Oh. It, it's new, you know, COVID, new. the uh, COVID uh, virus yeah. Cor coronavirus is, is new. But new. We have seen, yeah, a Spanish, we had Spanish flu in 1918. Yeah. That raged for three yeah. years. And as we get to know COVID, Yes. The virus, we got to know its um, behaviors and habits. And so then we can really do down the line, do an early detection because now yes. we're getting to know it. And it's like yes. when you're getting to know a friend you get or an enemy, you're, yes. you're getting to at know the, their behaviors. You can identify them at a distance. Yes. When you so, identify at a distance, then you have the time to protect yourself. Yes. So early in early detection and early intervention, detention. it's always been the concept in preventing in breaking, preventing the virus infection in us. Breaking it's the barrier. Been, yes. Breaking the chain of transmission of the virus. And that is the way all virus infections are actually taken care of. Antiviral drug can only slow down virus growth in our body, but our white blood cells that clears up any virus infections and that is clearing up this virus infection also. And they're memorizing it because they, it already they, had attacked yeah. your body. Yes. yes. When they saw this virus in me or in someone when they unfortunately getting infected, they remember that this is how they look like. And after they clear up this infection, kill this infection, then those so-called memory white blood cells lives in the infected patient's body, now recover for a long period of time, and hopefully they will protect them for the future infection, for future exposure. So there is there are hopes. I'm very yes. hopeful. If, yes. And, and again, knowledge is the truth. Knowledge is the power. We need to bring this information, this knowledge in a very lucid language, in an easy to understand manner to the community. And that will be our contribution, fight against this infection. So as we continue to wait for the perfect vaccine right. that would eventually uh, minimize and decrease everybody's fear about getting right. this virus, yes. we need to do our part. We need to do, we our, need part. To do our part. Yes. Yes. And also, there's another aspect I want to mention. As the vaccine will be coming in next three months or so, we need also to educate people that taking this vaccine will protect them. It will not cause them harm because there is there are already anti-vax move, move, movements vaccine, against vaccine, uh, vaccine people. They are already started their talking points. You do not need to take the vaccine. This vaccine might actually get you infections. There is no value to take the vaccine that talking point is already out in the community to some degree. This will be the time for us, not only educating people about this infection for their pro and protecting them, also educating them about the vaccines, benefits of getting the vaccine, how it will eventually protect them, and it will save not only them, their family, also the entire community so that we can get back to our normal life as quickly as possible. This would be the window of opportunity for that. How we can minimize the, the concept and the uh, yes. fallacy about that yes. the vaccines are actually harmful to them uh, yeah. or uh, it doesn't, you know, it the, the benefit of it doesn't exist yeah. and that it's better not to that to take it. So there there is already, just like you said, the anti-vaccine uh, moments going out, going going out. out. Yes. yeah so how we that. can help the community um globally, globally um how to minimize that that um you know misconception about the vaccine about the vaccine yeah. yes that, so, that, that this is this will be the window to to go out to the community along with everything else to educate them about the potential of vaccine and benefits yeah. of vaccination yes go ahead please. i had yeah i was going to interject that um yes. Last uh, the last two weeks, uh, I had uh, 
Miki Chon Dao from uh, Southern uh, Nevada Health District, who talked yeah. about immunization in preparation for the children going yeah. to school, and that um, students who, even though you're taking online, this is also the same with um, secondary school and also college level, where right. you still need to have a record of getting certain immunizations. Yes. yes. So those are what, what we call uh, admission uh, yeah, required immunization. requirements. Yes. 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 You, you Condi have condition have for enrollment or something like that. Enrollment. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. so it, uh, but that's a good point. Even within this pandemic situation, when many things are shut down, Still, uh, Southern Nevada Health District, they are opening up the, uh, in the vaccination immunization uh, clinic or immunization fair, I should say, at different places. I would advise the community member, even they are their children are not going to school, their immunization update record is a requirement for required. enrolling them, registering them with CCSD. So if go to one of those immunization uh, health fair or contact your PCP, primary care physician, where you usually take your children for regular checkup, annual wellness, or enduring in cases of sickness. If you go to your, uh, contact your PCP's office and provide them record of your immunization card, maybe via uh, a photo through your uh, phone, or uh, faxing them many different ways at remotely it can be done. They can check, does your child have updated immunization record? And they have a list from uh, Clark County CCSD. All the physicians are kind of required to maintain that updated list and they can match up if something is missing or another booster dose is required. They will give you an appointment in a safe environment uh, so that your child it remains updated on immunization and that will protect your child because other thing about this COVID-19 is that co-infection. Mm -hmm. Chances of bacterial co-infection goes up when someone is infected with COVID-19 and they have a heavy cough, mucus in their chest. So having regular immunization updated, we are protecting ourselves indirectly from the co-infectivity due to COVID-19. So that's, a, that's a bystander effect or added benefit of keeping us updated on our regular immunizations. And there you have it, our listeners out there. And thank you so much, Dr. Manas Mandal, for continuing uh, the conversation about the importance of immunization and also uh, very uh, wise um, information and uh, suggestion to our listeners out there and a continuation because August is the National Immunization, Immunization Awareness yes. Month. Yes. So what a great yes. continuation that uh, you yes. helped us continue that conversation. And thank you again for uh, being our guest tonight. And uh, of course, PHLB Radio for continuing to be our community partners to bring yes. important health information to our listeners out there. So I hope I get to see you because Roseman, uh, we have the option to stay at home and still do our job and yes. not have to go to on campus. So again, uh, as, a, as a citizen and as a faculty, you know, trying to stay away from giving if I have it, hopefully not giving it to someone and protecting ourselves. So please continue to wear your face mask. Please continue to follow the protocols for social distancing. I yes. only gro gro do grocery shopping once a week. And just like Dr. Manas, I'm, I go in the morning when there's yeah. not too many people. Not yeah. Many, not so, as sim yeah, as simple as that, that we can be part of uh, preventing the increase in the uh, infected people. Infection in the virus, yes. yes. Thank you once again to, you. to one line from me that I appreciate bringing me back here, PHLV Radio, Marife, John, and, and to the members of the community. I am a member of this community and I want all of us to stay healthy and hopeful we will get through it. Thank you once again. It's always a pleasure to have you and your passion to help the community just resonate. So um, I wanted to say to our listeners out there, remember, every Monday is a healthy Monday. Aloha. Aloha. 
the Asian American Pacific Islander Nurses Association of Nevada has just brought you Healthy Mondays with Apina of Nevada.